This is Jack Carr, and you are listening to Son of a Blitch. We're doing a podcast tonight. Yes. Oh, man. Yes. All right, let's do this. Let's do this. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being yeah, here, Jack. Of course. And on, on behalf of everyone here, just want to thank you for your service to start thank off you. with. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Well, man, last time you were here, it was the middle of the writer's strike. Yeah. And since then, you've put out a book. You got a nonfiction book, Targeted Beirut, coming out in September. You got the Terminalist prequel, Dark Wolf, and I assume you guys got season two that's in the works. It's been super busy, man. So congratulations, first Thank on you. on all of that wonderful things. Um, you know, I wanted to jump into Red Sky Morning first off, and you know, you bring Alice back in this book, talking about quantum computing, artificial intelligence, autonomous control, and I just wanted to know what are your feelings about the government and other governments taking controls with quantum computing and where do you feel like that's headed right now? And does that scare you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting time, obviously. So if you have an enemy that is developing quantum computers and uh, artificial intelligence and also building next generation platforms that allow for autonomous control, and you're not, then they're getting an advantage just by the speed with which they can make decisions. Um, and let's say that country is China, let's say they launch missiles at the United States from submarines off the coast, then those things can be, uh, they can be raining down in the United States before our generals are even out of bed. So that in turn means that we have to do that sort of thing. And we have to develop these technologies and these platforms that are at least have the capability for autonomous control. So in this, I, cre I created this character, Alice, two books ago for In the Blood. And that was before ChatGPT became like a uh, uh, part of the lexicon and part of our, I guess it's on our phones now, apparently, as a couple of days ago without even being able to like easily opt out of it. And so it wasn't really something that we were all thinking about. We knew it existed from films and, and science fiction and that sort of a thing, but it wasn't like a part of our everyday life yet. And uh, then that book came out and then the timing was good. So that was fantastic. And then I didn't want to, for the next book, for Only the Dead, I didn't want to rely on Alice, that character, to like save the day. So I just, I sidelined her for the last book because I didn't want it to be like for those of us who grew up in the 80s with uh, Michael Knight in the kit car, you know, like, uh, kid, I need you. And then all of a sudden diving into the Trans Am and off they go. So I didn't want to rely on that as a clutch. So, uh, so sidelined her for the last book. But once you introduce a character like that to a universe, you can't just forget about her. So uh, she's back in this one. And she's also put on a pattern her decision making off of a human. And that person is James Reese. And so as you get closer to the end, that'll come into play a bit. Yes. Um, you know, you were talking about characters. In your last book, you developed a character based loosely off of Ethel Kennedy. And I was curious, is there anybody in this book that you had a basis of, of the character that you wrote off of that you've met in life or that inspired you? Uh, next question. All right. No, Fair I'm just enough. kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, if you read the book, you should, by chapter, let's see, two and three, you should have a very good idea of who that character is based off of in real life. Inspired by. How about that? In mm -hmm. case there's any attorneys in here. Uh, <laughs> inspired by probably is the way to, to put it. And I change things. I mean, all these characters are created uh, just like anything else in life. We make decisions and do things based off our past experience and whatever foundation that we've built up to that point in life. So same things with, uh, with characters. You know, they're not a, uh, like a cut and paste from anybody in real life, but there are certainly, oh my goodness, I get a lot of inspiration from uh, a lot of politicians and senior military leaders. They give me a lot to work with. I guess that's the best way to put it. I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. Well, you know, in previous books, you've traveled and you've got some inspiration for some of the places that you've taken uh, James Reese. And I was just curious, did you go to China at mm -hmm. all for this? Because I get the feeling there's the more places you visit and you write about, there's more places you probably won't be going to in the future. Yes, this is true. Uh, and I wanted really to get to, to China for this book, to Macau in particular. Um, and I didn't really, I didn't know before I started doing the research that they make more there on gambling than we do in Vegas here. And 
and I had a uh, had a touch point, a connection with uh, somebody in in Vegas that ha- owns also a casino there. And I thought I'd zip over in a plane that similar to the one that I described in the book. I keep forgetting that this book just came out yesterday. Yeah. So if you haven't got to that part, I gotta remember that about spoilers. Uh, although that's not really too big of a spoiler. But uh, so I, I thought I was go- gonna zip over there, and then all these sort other things are coming up with uh, uh, scripts and just life in general and all sorts of things that I need to 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 get done. And so I was kind of up against the the clock. And then I saw an article about an Australian uh, novelist who um, went to, I think Macau or somewhere in China and got picked up and <laughs> thrown in jail for something that they had written. And I was like, ah, maybe I don't need to go to Macau. <laughs> Maybe I'm, maybe I'm good. I'm definitely not going now, but I was uh, fortunate that I went to, uh, to China back before I joined the military traveling around. So I have been to, uh, to Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and I went to Taiwan as well back then. So it's mm-hmm. a long time ago, but it's still, you know, it's still in, in the memory banks there and I still have photos and still remember what it felt like to be walking around and still remember what Tiananmen Square was like and remember the big pictures of Mao and, and all those things. So if you, if you read the book and get to those parts that describe those areas, um, that's because it, uh, it was, I mean, it's still semi-fresh in my mind after all these years because I was only there once and, uh, and it made an impact. So I, I try to do that as much as I can. I try to use places that I've already been if I can't go somewhere. And my idea at the beginning when I started is that I'd always go to one place for research and then choose as many other places as locations uh, as I could that I'd already been to. Um, but then... So for the first one, I'd been to Iraq and Afghanistan, and so I was good there. Uh, for the second one, I hadn't been to Mozambique. I knew that was going to play a pivotal role in that story. So I went there, spent a couple of weeks on the ground, and got to weave that flavor into True Believer. Savage Sun, I went to, to Russia, to Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia. So I wanted to, to see what it was like out there. I'd been to Moscow before, once again, traveling around uh, the world before I went in the military. So I'd been to Moscow before, but I hadn't been to uh, sort of the, the eastern side of Russia. So I got to go over there i don't think i'll go back though after <laughs> that was uh I, I think i just made it in under the wire as far as uh you know some things i say in these in these books so went there for that one and then for the next one uh COVID hit so everything was kind of shut down for the devil's hand luckily that one was more domestic uh not totally but mostly uh domestic based uh, so i chose places already that i'd already been for that one and then the next one in the blood i wanted to get to israel and I didn't get to go because it was just really harsh. COVID was still going on. And unless you were an Israeli citizen, even if you were an Israeli citizen, it was hard to get in and out of Israel during COVID. They locked it down pretty hard. So I didn't get to go over there, but I sent that one to a family over there that had three generations read the book. So I had somebody in their 30s, somebody in their 60s, and somebody in their 90s read it. And they all said that they couldn't believe that I hadn't been over there. So that was all done just with uh, with research, just online and books and articles and that sort of thing. So, um, so I just haven't gotten to really go anywhere to do research and for this one same same thing but it's probably good because i might still be in china well i'm glad you didn't go for that um you know you mentioned a plane in this book in actually on the cover too you feature the lake buccaneer that's right and this was a plane that you read about in 1985 on uh i think it was centrifuge That's right. and the same day you picked up Rambo part two That's and right. uh, you said that day you wanted to feature this plane in a book and that one day you also wanted to own one so I was right. curious you put James Reese behind the controls of the plane have you taken some pilot lessons and are you any closer to owning a Lake Buccaneer no <laughs> um, and my wife's not here so maybe I can answer this truthfully uh, <laughs> No, just kidding. I, so I, I did. I read that book in the summer of 1985, read it in one day, absolutely loved it and told myself that one day I'd, I'd include that plane in a novel that, I, that I'd, I'd write. So that was this was the one, the natural one to include that plane in. So put it on the cover. The paperback edition of that book also had it on the cover back in, in 85. So that was, I really wanted to get it on the cover of this book. So it's on the spine of this book and then it's on the, uh, the cover of the, the audio, um, the CDs or the audio graphic. So uh, I... I wanted to fly in one before uh, the book came out or before I wrote that section. But once again, trying to do research and travel didn't really work out. But I talked to somebody who has uh, whose father loved this plane and had has had multiple planes. I think they either bought the company or they have some affiliation with the with the company. They don't make the plane anymore. They make parts for it still. So I talked to him, sent the chapters to him. I did all my research first, though, because uh, you can get on YouTube and kind of really get walked through like pre-checks and, and all sorts of things. You can do a lot of um, a lot of research on YouTube for something like that. And I really felt like I could get in that plane and 
take that thing off with just the research that I did, but I know I really can't. Um, <laughs> and I shouldn't. How about that? I shouldn't. Or I could maybe take off. I couldn't land. Maybe I feel pretty confident that I could get airborne or skip along the water for a little bit. But uh, I wanted to make sure that someone who loved that plane, because it's a really um, dedicated community to that platform. And so I wanted someone who loved that plane, has one, has flown one before, to at least know that I put in the effort to get it right. So uh, just, that's why it's described in such detail there. But I talked to a guy who um, I found him on, on Instagram and, and started following and just checking out the plane and then sent him the chapters and he checked it out and sent them back to me with a couple corrections on there. So it should be fairly accurate. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about your recent travels, of which there are many. I mean, you've been in Budapest, but the one I wanted to focus on real quick, and we'll jump into the Budapest time because that's obviously with Dark Wolf. But you were in Normandy for the 80th anniversary yeah. of D-Day, and you had some of your kids there with you. And I just wanted to ask you about that experience. What was that like for you? I know that you had been there before, and that's the best defense foundation yep. that took all of these amazing, it was like 48 different yep. Uh, you know, veterans between, you know, 100 or close to uh, to that age. And I just wanted to, you know, hear about your experience with that and if you can share that with uh, everyone here. Yeah, so I, uh, I've known Donnie Edwards, who started the Best Defense Foundation for, I don't know, probably a little over a decade now or so. And he's a former NFL player. And his grandfather was at Pearl Harbor, so his grandfather passed along all these amazing lessons to him. He had so much respect for his grandfather. And then when he was in the NFL, he just started taking guys back to battlefields on which they fought to uh, just on his own dime, just, just doing it on his own. Pearl Harbor, Normandy uh, in particular. Uh, also the Netherlands, I think, at some point. But then when he got out, he started the Best Defense Foundation to continue that mission. And it's like a full-time thing. It's amazing how much work that uh, everybody puts into that. But I did the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor a couple years ago with my daughter. She was 15 at the time. And they hadn't had any younger people come and help out these veterans before. But just seeing her work with these veterans and how they just lit up talking to someone from her generation uh, about the things that they experienced in World War II uh, was added so much value to the trip for them and to my daughter. But, uh, but for them in particular, they just loved talking to her so they uh, allowed her to come back for the 78th anniversary of a d-day and we did that and really helping these guys getting out of their wheelchairs getting them to the events making sure they're taking their medicines making sure they're eating all those things so you're really it's it's a lot of of work and it's but it's so fulfilling so we did that and then went back again here for the 80th and uh, they're all yeah they're all creeping up on 100 at 100 or over 100 years old and uh, it's not just one day back there it's not just june 6th it's at least two weeks of events so we were there for um for for two weeks but it starts in atlanta first everybody gathers there and delta flies everyone out lands in normandy and they land a big aircraft out there and it's not a normal flight uh they they usually just go to paris and then you have to drive up or or take a train up from there but they went out surveyed the runway and they brought one of their these big jets in with these guys all in first class and um they had a great couple weeks out there and it's just a very powerful experience but from from an American's perspective in northern France in June, there's such a feeling of patriotism for the United States there. And there's American flags everywhere, 101st airborne flags everywhere, 82nd airborne flags everywhere. So it's really cool to uh, to be there during that time and see this outpouring of gratitude and support that's now multi-generational because it's not just from the older people. They have passed it down. And it's not something they just talk about once a week in, in or once a year in school or something like that. I think they talk about it every single day because the youngest kid up to the oldest person they all have that same look on their face and they're all just so proud and want to just talk to these guys want to get their autographs we make these baseball cards that have their stats on them and what they looked like in world war ii what they look like now what they did during the war and they're panning these things out as we're pushing them through the streets in these parades everyone's dressed up in world war ii era clothing with world war ii era jeeps and harley and indian motorcycles and it's just an amazing thing to experience and i think i saw more american flags in normandy than i've ever seen in um, America on the 4th of July anywhere that I've been in my life. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing to experience, but that's because they were occupied sure, and then they were liberated. And uh, these kids that liberated them and they essentially were, some of them lied about their age, 15 years old. And I think we have a misconception about what they looked like because we see Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan and maybe Tom Hanks was like 45 maybe when he filmed that or something. And then John Wayne in The Longest Day who was, who was up there as well. But then you think about these guys that are storming the beaches of Normandy or jumping out with 101st Airborne or landing gliders with 82nd. And uh, they were like, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. They were young. They were very young. Well, you know, I wanted to bring it back to your time when you were in Budapest, Hungary. You guys have been filming 
uh, Terminalist, Dark Wolf. Why don't you kind of catch us all up? When might we be seeing that uh, air? I know you had the director's cut of the first episode that you guys yeah. got to go check out recently. I heard you talking about that. So yeah, if you can just maybe kind of you know catch us up with what the plans are with that right now. Yeah, so I'm not sure. We don't have a date that it's coming out, but I would expect that we finish it up in the next month or so. It goes into post-production, so I would expect it sometime in 2025. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no date or anything yet. But uh, yeah, filming in Budapest, amazing city over there. Once again, uh, went, went over there before I joined the military, so it had been, it's been a while, been a moon or two since I was had been back but it's so interesting there are um ferraris uh lamborghinis bentleys porsches are a dime a dozen mercedes a dime a dozen um it's incredible how much wealth is uh is i don't know if it's from there or if it's coming in there but there's certainly a lot of russian money ukrainian money chinese money there um and uh by ukrainian money probably some of ours um that's just kind of getting some some really nice cars over there so it might make an appearance in a future novel. There's just too much going on in Budapest right now not to include in a book. Uh, it's such a fascinating place. So, uh, so it might make it into a, a future novel. But yeah, filming there now. Everybody's crushing it. There is, uh, I feel there's a lot more trust from senior level executives at Amazon this time around because they saw the data last time. And so that means you built up a little political capital, build up some trust. So there's not as many questions coming down this time as there were last time. There were a lot of questions last time. So there's almost zero this time. It's been fantastic. So much more freedom in these scripts. Uh, but it's interesting filming overseas. And I was always very forgiving about things that I saw, whether it's like military or something that I may know about law enforcement or weapons handling, whatever it might be. Uh, very forgiving when I'd watch something. And I always try to just enjoy it for what it was. And now I have even more appreciation, more forgiveness for things that I see that are a little bit off because it's so hard to, to film anything, uh, anything good, certainly, because there's so many opportunities for it to go off the road but uh, or off the rails. But it's uh, just getting getting weapons that you need in a country like that. You have to have like six months ahead of time. You're filling out ATF forms and import forms and all this stuff. So if you want to make a change to something uh, because you have a better idea, but oh, well, that would have been a good idea six months ago. So we could have got this thing into the country. And uh, so there's just things like that that you don't really account for if you're uh, if you're in the in the audience and don't know some of the intricacies. So always been forgiving, but now I'm even more forgiving when I see a show. Well, in that show, too, you kind of talked about the first time through filming Terminalist uh, and, and kind of leading up to that, too. You were kind of new to that role in that in that film adaptation. And now you're a part of casting. You're a part of writing. What is kind of your role in your day to day when you're on set there? Yeah, when I'm on set there, I catch so much. So I wish I was, if I didn't have anything else to do, I'd be on set every single day. So as an executive producer, um, you really add value where you can. Um, and so for me, it's really throughout. It's all of it. Um, but being there on set, you can get to you you get to have like a strategic level view of what's going on if you're not uh, there every single day. So that's kind of, I think that's what I add when I show up is that I can look at it and, uh, and add value through what I'm, what I'm seeing. Cause I'm not in, intimately involved with it on a day to day basis. Now that they're in Budapest and I'm on book tour and doing all these other, other things. But, uh, but yeah, you're just in there with the, the EP team. So it's me, David DeGilio, uh, Max Adams, former army ranger, Jared Shaw, the guy who gave the book to, to Chris Pratt and, uh, and Taylor Kitsch. Like that's the, the kind of the, the group that, uh, is there every single day. And then Chris is in and out to film film his scenes so he's uh he uh, gives his input when he's there and that sort of sort of a thing but uh, and the director um uh, frederick toy and who did um uh, shogun if anybody's seen shogun he did episode three or four anyway amazing guy so we have a good uh we have a great crew we have very i feel very, extremely fortunate that we have such a good good group of guys and what's the rollout looking like for the terminal list as far as season two and beyond are you looking to do each season based on a book or is there going to be kind of a culmination or is there going to be some writing and some expansion of maybe outside of the book and outside the realm of, of that kind of, you know, as far as the chapters of things? Yeah, we'll see. But right now it's, uh, it's this prequel origin story mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we'll see if it goes, uh, for more than one season. You never, you never know. Uh, but then we roll right into true believer. So we roll right into writing that and then filming that probably sometime in early 2025. We'll see. But, nice. uh, yeah, get to, get to work on that one, and then who knows? We'll see where it goes from there. Probably all depends on what Chris wants to do. That's fair, yeah. He's yeah. a busy man. Well, um, you know, you also have Targeted Beirut, which is your first nonfiction. It's going to be coming out in a few months. Uh, you linked up with James Scott there, who's 
had a lot of historical books under his belt. I was just kind of curious, how did you guys come to meet and decide that you wanted to do this first book in a series of which, you know, you said maybe every other year you want to put something out. Yeah. How did you guys kind of come together with that? Yeah, so I wanted to do, uh, just looking at the space in general, you look at what Tom Clancy did in the 80s. Um, he has his books coming out. You never knew one was coming out. Maybe it was every year, maybe it was every year and a half, maybe even two years, maybe even two and a half years. And then in the early 90s, he starts doing nonfiction. Um, he starts doing some other things as well with video games and and uh, other co-written thrillers. But uh, so I was, you know, growing up, I was v well aware of that and uh, always considered that an option. So I wanted to do some uh, a nonfiction series that looked at different terrorist events and and really tried to keep those lessons alive from those events for future generations so that they don't have to learn the same lessons in blood. And uh, 1983, Beirut barracks bombing, the Marines lost more people in a single day than they'd lost since Iwo Jima in World War II. And for me, it was a very seminal event because I'm a kid, I'm around nine, 10 years old, and uh, I'm, I know I wanna join the military later in life, and I'm seeing these uh, Time Magazine cover come across my parents' uh, or our dining room table, uh, Newsweek, I'm seeing our, the news on television, five o'clock and six o'clock at night, uh, newspapers. And so you're seeing this devastation over there, and so you're aware that there was this terrorist attack, and it was really Really, a, uh, it, there were some things that led up to it. So there was an embassy bombing in April, and then you have the administration talking about the Marines over there being peacekeepers all the way up through October and, and past. But uh, they were in combat. Those guys, now that I've done all this research, they were 100% in combat. Uh, so it's very interesting to see administration talking points coming out in the spring, summer, fall of 1983, and when those guys were in actual combat. So well, always something that I always wanted to do, and uh, so I pitched it to to Simon and Schuster and they said yes let's do it and uh and then I thought well who do I want to work with this on and there was only one person James Scott so uh so I reached out to him and asked him and he was fired up to do it so uh that's yeah that's how it went he has five books out four on World War II and uh and one not on World War II um but amazing guy and he knows how to do all that uh like annotate everything legally for those that have not having experience in the non-fiction non space you really have to know what you're doing when you're annotating different different quotes and sources and all that stuff because if you mess something up in one of these books uh that i write here uh you can just say oh it's fiction <laughs> you know it's okay but there's none of that for the non-fiction space you really have to uh, have that right have that down and he's a, he's so good at it and such a great guy so that comes out september 24th nice yeah. um you also in in this recent book you talked about a typewriter that is and you actually own one of hemingway's typewriters i was curious how did you come to get that yeah, it's a bit of classified because the person asked me to never, never to say who they were, Fair but uh, <laughs> it was uh, gifted to me in uh, early 2020. So right before COVID, uh, there was a guy, A.E. Hotchter, uh, I think I'm pronouncing his name semi-right, um, but he he also co-founded uh, Newman's Own with Paul Newman. So he was this guy, kind of a mover and a shaker, a manager-ish type person in that crowd back in the day and so he got Hemingway a typewriter to write a movable feast on and uh, he passed away I think in late 2021 and then all his memorabilia all the things he's collected over the years went up for auction uh, including this typewriter and uh, a, uh, a reader saw it and wanted to get it for me so it's now uh, it's in our, our house and I got it and I typed one Hemingway sentence on there and then let it let it just sit of course the kids have walked by and gone like it's like, oh, God. But, you know, that's just how it goes. Nice. I think Hemingway would approve. Of course, of course. Well, I wanted to open it up to the audience to have some question answering before we get to the photography. I have a microphone set up over here. I have it turned off right now. So if anybody wants to come step up to it, just flip that towards you, the switch on top. And uh, don't be bashful. Come on. Oh, wow. You got to walk all the way up there? That's intimidating. Yeah. Jeez. If, if, if it's too hard to walk up there, you can shout it out and we'll yeah, interpret yeah, and I can, it Yeah, I can repeat it. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Somebody's up. Somebody's at the mic. So you came pretty hot out the gate once you retired from the Navy with your first book. My question is, how did you, well, I'm assuming you were writing while you were still in. Well, last year, year and a half, when Was I wasn't, it? didn't really have any responsibilities other than getting out of said bureaucracy. Okay. Yeah. How did you divide up? Navy time, family time, writing time, to be able to do what you did, you know, right after you retired to where it's just boom, 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 everything hit. 
Well, it was actually easier when I was still in the military because there was nothing else other than family. There wasn't, uh, uh, in that last year, for those who have been in the military and tried to get out of it, it, uh, it takes a little time to, to go and do all your medical, do all your dental, get read out of all these different secret programs, turn in gear. Uh, and then they have these like, uh, uh, I don't know, transition assistance program or something like that, something like that. And, uh, so which was totally useless. Um, and so you, but you have to like make, you can't just like go to these things. You also have to stand in line first to, uh, to make your appointment uh maybe not now maybe there's an app now or something probably not but it's uh stand in line so that's you have a lot of time on your hands and you go in a different pile so once i dropped my papers at least my experience was uh drop your papers you kind of go in this different pile and you have to do all these things to get out and i think the command's actually like responsible to make sure that you do all that stuff so they just kind of want to make sure you do it so that was time so i just took advantage of it and uh and started writing so i started writing De- december of 2014 was when i wrote the first words to uh to the terminal list and also when i chose chris pratt and antoine fuqua uh, even though i didn't know them and i uh, had no connections to hollywood or publishing but uh but i didn't really worry about any of that other stuff there was nothing really to worry about there was no one to try to reach out to or think about reaching out to and publishing or anything like that because i didn't know anyone um so it was all really about the book and then there was so I wasn't taking guys down range anymore, so that wasn't weighing heavily on me. I didn't feel like I needed to spend every waking second studying the enemy, studying uh, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, terrorism, uh, be training all the time, even on my own time. Um, so I just uh, felt like I could I could uh, start doing something different. And so that was writing and, and family, because there was nothing else back then. And uh, and then, yeah, I got it and got it to Simon & Schuster, and luckily they loved it, and off we went to the races. So. It's, uh, I don't know how else, yeah, I got uh, very fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Awesome. Next up. Uh, huge fan, obviously. Oh, thank you. Just finished the book. The thing's the best one yet. Thank it's you. totally amazing. Thank you. And uh, so you have an amazing ability to- well, You like, read it in one day? Did you get it early? And so I got it yesterday. Got it yesterday. Dang, so, that's yeah. awesome. Wow. So. Nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give it up. Nice. So, coffee yeah nice <laughs> glad you included the flux raider nice. all, all the cool kids have them yeah yeah and uh but you so you have an amazing ability to tell the future so like the the thing i hope i'm not telling the future in this one <laughs> and I so really well hope. that that's really. kind of my so like the ukraine thing the israel thing like you i mean i remember whenever like the Ukraine thing happened i was like i just read about that like in a book you know Crazy. and so how are you able to do that uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. what's your What's trade your secrets, s- my friend. Trade <laughs> secrets. No, no. Well, that well, a couple of them aren't really that difficult to predict, like the uh, the Ukrainian invasion or uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, just if you read Peter Zion, he predicted that in 2014 down to the the year, um, and because he, he's looking at uh, population decline, and what he looked at for that in particular was uh, was when is the last time that Russia can field an army uh, at the current at its current size? When does that start to decline because of population, because of the demographics? And so he he. Uh, he predicted that to the to the year and uh so i incorporated that one in there um and then some other things covid just happened to be randomly um writing a book about what the enemy has learned from watching us on the field of battle for the last 20 years uh and i was using a bioweapon as part of that and then covid hit which was kind of wild and because i'm also writing really about what the enemy's learned about us well we move into a summer of civil unrest and then a very contentious election cycle. Um, and so once again, the enemy is looking at all of that. And by enemy, I mean, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, super empowered individuals, terrorist organizations. So they're all learning something and taking notes and figuring out what they can do, what can they exploit and, uh, and how they can divide us further. Um, one of those old quotes, I forget who said it, but you know, don't interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake type of a thing so uh that's that was my takeaway from writing that book was like geez man all they need to really do is step back and kind of watch us we're doing a pretty good job of destroying ourselves from the inside right now unfortunately so uh but i like to remain hopeful i try to remain hopeful uh yeah yeah so uh so then came in the blood you know no uh so so i don't know about it's just i look at uh yeah past experience all the things that i studied throughout my life warfare um and uh and then all the reading that i've done all my life not on the warfare side or the nonfiction side but the fiction side and reading the the masters like tom clancy and nelson demille and aj quinnell and jc pollock and mark olden david morrell louis lamore all these guys uh really my professors in the art of storytelling and then combining those things together uh, as i got 
out, out of the military allowed me to create James Reese in this universe. So um, that's a very long way of me saying that, uh, once again, the uh, dynamics currently at play in the world right now give me a, a lot to uh, a lot to work with. And having that background allows me to make some projections here and there, mostly by putting myself in the enemy's shoes. Yeah. Thank you. And that Flux Raider, that thing I saw, first time I saw that was like five years ago, and I was like, who's going to use this thing? I didn't quite get it. And, uh, and then I, oh, I started talking to some people that actually use them. Uh, about, and, uh, and so then that's why I made it into the book. So it's a pretty cool little, little deal. Yeah. Next question. So I kind of just wanted to change topics a little bit um, and ask more of a question about you. And like I've listened to your podcast and like a bunch of different things, and I feel like you take a lot of inspiration for a lot of your characters from people you know. We kind of talked about that earlier. Is there anything like James Reese and um, oh my god, I just forgot his name, Rafe? Rafe. Yes, mm -hmm. our uh, you know huge hunters in the backcountry, Montana. Yeah. Is there any truth to that as far as you go? Like, do you love to hunt and fish, and mm -hmm. what's your favorite type of uh, hunting? Yeah. So, it, yes, <laughs> on, on, on all. Um, but I wanted to differentiate the two because I knew they were going to be in the military about the same time. They're both going to be SEALs. Um, how can I differentiate these characters enough from one another where you really do have a difference? Um, and so I made Rafe just a tiny tad bit older, not by much, like just a year older, um, but a background with a family coming from Rhodesia. So I really wanted to do that because I hadn't seen that done before. And growing up, who, uh, who else here had the, considers the 80s their formative years? Yes. Anybody? Nice. Awesome. I like it. Who, who, uh, who uh, perused a Soldier of Fortune magazine back in the day? Yeah, nice. <laughs> Same hands. Awesome. Um, so growing up, going through that magazine, you're reading about this place called Rhodesia and like, what's going on over there? You're seeing these guys in like UD t-shirts and, uh, you know, combat boots with FNFALs with this crazy camouflage pattern on there. You're not really sure exactly what's going on if you're reading that in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Um, but you see that like, wow, these weapons are pretty cool. Um, and so I knew I wanted to incorporate that into uh, a novel because it's not something that that we as, uh, as Americans really we don't really read about it in popular culture I think Blood Diamond was the first time we really had uh, a movie that uh, in pop, something from popular culture that uh, that focused on on that area our character with uh, with a background in that area so I wanted to wanted to do that but wanted to make uh, Rafe have a connection there and so I do that through the gear. Obviously, his family, a little bit of an accent, um, and uh, and some of his mindset that comes from what happened to his family over there and what happened to to the country over there. But uh, also through the gear. So with uh, the Courtney boots and um, and with uh, with essentially leather holsters instead of Kydex and uh, a 1911 that has a history to it that's been passed down through the generations. So uh, I try to use all those things to to differentiate these characters and give them interesting backstories as well. So, um, and then the hunting piece is something that bonds those guys together because really from the beginning of time, that's something that's primal and it's visceral and it's something that all of our ancestors had to be good at, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. So uh, I try to key into that and in each book, um, there's some element of fire somewhere. And, uh, and I do that because the first stories were essentially told around those fires and, uh, and they had lessons in them, whether they were just stories about what actually happened or they were stories that were, um, that we had these real elements, but were fictionalized so you could remember them. So you could pass down these lessons of warfare and of the hunt. So I thought that was a, that was an important thing to, uh, to tap into to creating these characters. And uh, yes, so I, uh, I haven't been hunting for a little bit. Well, I guess I did go over to Hawaii, but it's not really the same kind of hunting. Uh, it's, you're hunting out of the Four Seasons on Lanai, which is a little, <laughs> a little, a little different. But, uh, but in Mozambique, certainly. I mean, I, and I love the different hunting traditions around the world as well, because each, even every country in Europe has a slightly different one. So I want to spend some more time over there doing that. But I've been to Africa many times, and uh, of course, in, in uh, the United States and the, the Western Mountains, um, elk and moose and that sort of thing. So. Uh, you know, El County's, uh, but uh, this is my favorite, but, uh, I feel like maybe I should temper my, my, my answers, but, uh, I hadn't really done any predator hunting up until, uh, I did the research for Savage Sun in Kamchatka Peninsula. And, uh, there was something about going out after something that can tear you up and eat you that, uh, that was, there was a, a draw there. I didn't really expect it cause I hadn't done that sort of hunting, um, in my past. So, uh, there was something different about it and, uh, I don't know what it was, but there was, there was some sort of a connection there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Absolutely. 
And I'm canceled. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hire you. <laughs> So you stated that you're a really big James Bond fan, and even there's some 007 Easter eggs in this one. What are some of your favorite James Bond moments or movies that inspired James Reese in this book and beyond? Yeah, good question. So uh, it was the 007th book, so I figured this was the time to go down to, uh, to GoldenEye in Jamaica, where Ian Fleming wrote all of the Bond books down there. So, uh, so I went down there last summer and uh, used it as an excuse to get down there and then got to go sit at his desk where he wrote all those books and open up the big windows there that overlook this lawn and then this cliff that drops down to his private beach and then the, the ocean beyond. So it's, uh, it was just such an incredible experience to be there in that place. For me, it was just a magical experience. And um, uh, having been a fan of his from the early stage and from a, as a kid so because it's always it wasn't just James Bond movie or whatever it was always Ian Fleming's James Bond and that was really cool to see that as a kid well who's this Ian Fleming guy and I can ask my dad back then and you know get a little bit but there wasn't something you can just type it into a machine and get a lot of stuff back um, there were a couple books back then that uh, that we had some books I got from the library about uh, Ian Fleming there was uh, one book that went through all the Bond book on movies up to that point whenever that was in the early 80s that I was uh, looking at that stuff um, so yeah it was a uh, you know, important part of my childhood Childhood, I think I watched those movies over and over and over again um, and then read the books uh, a little bit later but uh, but it's always been so it's so having it be a part of my life from that early age knowing I wanted to write one day it's just a part of my experience so uh, this one was the time to incorporate some uh, Easter eggs in there I guess you call them but um, references I guess is something uh, is probably more accurate and it uh, there's something in there for the most casual viewer of like a Bond film, and then there are things that even the most ardent Bond fan won't recognize. I think there's a couple that I only I'll get because um, I morphed it enough where it's just like a hint of something. So there's something in there for everybody if they're a Bond fan. So uh, there's there's quite a few of them in here. So it's the 007th book, so there's that, and then it's also the 40th anniversary of the Hunt for Red October this year. So that's why it starts out with a uh, Clancy-esque type prologue with submarines that started turning into a whole book, and it's probably one of the reasons this book, we're here in June instead of May when the book was supposed to come out because um, I know nothing about submarines I know something now I didn't know something at the beginning so I took a lot of uh, a lot of research and I did take a little literary license there uh, for those who have spent some time in subs but um, uh, yeah it was a uh, it was fun to write and some of my favorite bond moments are films I, like, I mean there's something about all of them I don't like look at them with a critical eye I try to enjoy them I try to enjoy everything that I read or everything that I that I watch um, so I don't I try to be too critical of them um, so I like some of the the early stuff uh of course i love goldfinger was probably for me as a kid was the one i watched the most and then thunderball because i knew i wanted to be a seal from such an early age so it has those scenes in there but i think now i have a greater appreciation for from russia with love and dr no um and i always liked you only live Tri twice because as we mentioned i'm growing up in the 80s and it's the ninja craze time so uh you only live twice is uh i think i have two references to you only live twice in this book so I think I wove two, two in, but, uh, but I love that, that growing up as well. So, um, yeah, I love it all. I love it all. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I think I do have a little, little something here. Um, oh, but, oh, I forgot one thing. So no one's asking me, but, uh, if they did ask me about what to do next with the Bond franchise, um, I think, I think they should go back and do the books, but do them as period pieces. So you start, you do Casino Royale, but you do it in the 50s. And for those who have read the book, they know that, uh, that James Bond drove an old Bentley in that one. He didn't drive an Aston Martin. He drove this Bentley back then from 1937, I think it was. Um, so you do them as period pieces. So end of World War II, you have the British Empire in decline, and then you have uh, the creation, James Bond. So I think they should go back and do the books, but do them as true or true or truer adaptation period period pieces in order to save the uh, save the franchise after what they did at the end of the last one, but I won't spoil that for anyone who hasn't seen it. So, um, All right, um, what else do we have? And before I get to this last piece, uh, I just want to say that thank you so much for being here. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, this is my favorite part of uh, doing this, is being able to say thank you. I can try to say thank you as much as I possibly can uh, online. I try to hit that little heart button and thank people that reach out and say that uh, they watched the, watched the show and liked it or to the podcast and liked it or uh, read the books or shared them with their dad and now they talked about them or whatever. I just like to thank them online, but it's different where I get to shake your hand here and look into people's eyes.
guys and and thank you in person because uh, it means the world to me and it allows me to do what I love to do, which is right. So uh, so thank you all so much. And then uh, also. Right now, sun's uh, sun is going down here. It means it's coming up on another side of the world. So I always like to think about um, those people that are out there on uh, front lines, even though there's not Iraq and Afghanistan or not in the same way that it used to be anyway. But there are men and women out there that are uh, that are doing some jobs in some austere places, and just like to remember that they're uh, that they're out there doing that. What we allows us to be here doing this. So uh, so thank you all so much. Appreciate everything. Thank you, Jack.